Stanford University. Hello, and welcome back to E145 Technology Entrepreneurship. In today's video, we're going to be talking about creativity and innovation. So today's agenda, we're going to first talk a bit about how to hack brainstorming and become more creative. And then we're going to give you a chance to do a bit of brainstorming. So how should we hack brainstorming? What would we do if we wanted to try and increase the effectiveness of our brainstorming sessions and get a greater number of new creative ideas out for our ventures? What do you think are some good characteristics of brainstorming sessions? How would you design a brainstorming session if you were trying to make it more effective? Uh, how would you lead it? What would you do? So it turns out there's been some research that's been done on brainstorming. And so here we see a table um, from one of those results. And here the brainstorming task was in a uh, setting with a German population. And so the task was to come up with new ways to uh, improve the relationship between the German population and a set of foreign guest workers. And so the um, people were divided up into either a real group or a nominal group. A real group means that the individuals were actually sitting around the same table. They had a microphone to record the um, ideas that they came up with during the brainstorming session. And a nominal group, on the other hand, is a group where the individuals were placed in separate rooms, also given a microphone to record their brainstorming session, but they essentially brainstormed on their own. And then the study also varied the assessment instructions. Under the personal assessment instructions, they were told that the number and quality of ideas that they came up with individually was going to be compared with other individuals. Under the collective assessment condition, they were told that the group would be compared with other brainstorming groups in terms of the number and quality of ideas. And so you might expect that if it's the group being evaluated, the collective condition, that there might be some free riding where people feel less responsible for generating ideas because it's not their own individual performance that's being judged, it's the groups. And so what do, what do we see? The, the investigators later evaluated the number and quality of ideas. They had two different external assistants uh, right, um, judge the number of ideas and also judge their quality and originality. And so we see that, first of all, just comparing the real group to the nominal group, we see that the nominal groups produced a lot more ideas total, and they also produced a higher number of new good ideas. The originality was rated similar across, and the average feasibility was a bit higher for the real group. And so why is this? We tend to think that group brainstorming is a good idea, that by getting together, people can piggyback on one another's ideas and come up with more ideas. But the evidence seems to point to this idea that the nominal group, that the actual uh, four individuals brainstorming separately come up with more ideas and more good ideas than four people brainstorming together in a real group. So why could this be? There are two potential reasons. One potential reason is because of production blocking, that as one person is talking, it's then difficult for the other people to simultaneously talk. And so time is lost because your production of good ideas is blocked by the other people talking. The second possible reason is evaluation apprehension, that people are withholding ideas and not saying potentially new crazy ideas because they're worried that they're going to be judged as too crazy or that these ideas are going to be judged as bad ideas. The next table tables that I'm going to show will start to look at whether these can be the reasons why. But before I move on from this slide, let me just point out that there are also differences across the personal and collective ev um, evaluation. So it is true that telling people that they'll, they will be evaluated individually results in a higher number of ideas and a higher number of good ideas relative to 
people who are told that the group will be evaluated collectively. And so it, it turns out to be a good idea to give people individual incentives uh, that the number of ideas they produce individually is going to matter rather than just the group. So let's look at another table. In this table, we have um, the same real group versus nominal group split. And we again observe that the nominal group, where it's four individuals in separate rooms brainstorming separately and then combining their ideas, produces a greater number of ideas than the real group. And we also again see that the personal assessment outperforms the collective assessment in terms of the ideas produced. In this case, subjects were also asked whether they uh, felt a lot of apprehension about being judged. And so in the real group, you see that there's not much difference between low and high evaluation apprehension. The number of ideas is similar. But for the nominal group, once you take out that influence of peers being located in the same room who are potentially judging you, those who had lower evaluation apprehension actually generated more ideas. And so this provides some evidence that it is the fear of being judged that's keeping people from producing more ideas in a group setting as opposed to when they produce ideas individually. So one possible way to get around this is to have your group brainstorming sessions be electronic. If you're brainstorming over, say, email or instant messenger, then this gets around both the problems of production blocking, everyone can write at the same time, and it gets around slightly the problem of evaluation apprehension in that you don't have people directly in front of you who could be judging your ideas. And so this study looks at this uh, potential solution. It compares electronic brainstorming with non-electronic brainstorming. And it also varies the group size. So here we have groups of two, groups of four, or groups of six. And so what do we see? We first look at the, the pure number of non-redundant ideas. And you see that in the smallest group, groups of two, the electronic brainstorming performs similarly to non-electronic brainstorming. But once we get into the larger groups, you start to see that electronic brainstorming outperforms non-electronic brainstorming. And this is most pronounced in this condition with six people. So as you get larger groups of people brainstorming, it becomes even better to do it electronically rather than in person together as a group. But what about the quality of the ideas? So next we have the external ratings of the quality of ideas. And again, you see similar results in the smallest group, but it's once you get to the larger group sizes that the electronic brainstorming really starts to outperform um, in-person brainstorming. And so then these two final um, questions ask people specifically about whether they felt that their production of new ideas was being blocked by other people and whether they felt apprehension about being evaluated. And you again see that these are a lot higher in, as you would expect, in the in-person groups as compared to the electronic groups. Again, not as much difference in the smaller groups, but as you get to the largest groups, you see that the um, people who brainstormed in person felt much more that their ideas were being blocked by others and that they felt apprehension about being evaluated. And in terms of the overall satisfaction with the brainstorming experience, we see similar patterns. Not much difference in the smallest groups, but once we get to the largest group size, those who were brainstorming electronically were also more satisfied with the brainstorming experience than those who did it in an actual in-person group. And so this just continues um, to show the similar results, but now we move up to group sizes of 6 and 12. And we continue to see that we get the largest number of new non-redundant ideas in the electronic brainstorming, and also that the overall quality of those ideas is significantly higher. And so if you're interested in this and want to read more, these are the citations for the brainstorming studies that I mentioned. And in the previous video, I mentioned a study about using lead users to generate new ideas for products. And that paper is here. So if we take a step back and ask what characteristics, how should a brainstorming session be run, we um, can take a few takeaways out of these results. 
One is that you want to be careful how you capture ideas. So you want to avoid the tyranny of the pen. When one person is up at the board and is the one who has power to write down ideas, this can result in a lot of production blocking. It keeps people from simultaneously writing down ideas, and this then is going to generate fewer ideas total. So you want everyone to be writing. Ideally, you want to record audio or record video. And in this way, the actual recording of ideas is as little of a barrier as possible. Ideally, you actually want your brainstorming to run individually. Instead of bringing four people together in the same room to brainstorm, have them brainstorm on their own separately beforehand and use the group to evaluate ideas. A second issue that you want to think about is how you frame the problem. If you give people a very narrow question to brainstorm around, you're going to get a much more narrow set of potential ideas. On the other hand, if you make the problem too big, how do we improve the world, then it's difficult for people to come up with concrete ideas. And so you want to frame the problem in such a way that's at a more middle ground, um, that it's broad enough for people to come up with creative out-of-the-box ideas, but not so broad that it becomes intractable. And narrow enough that people can get specific and it's applicable, but not so narrow that it restricts the possible ideas. And then finally, I think the most important thing is due to the impact of evaluation apprehension, due to the fear of being judged, you want to separate as much as possible the idea generation phase from the idea evaluation phase. Um, so you need to separate these either in time or in different meetings and have one phase be solely dedicated to generating as many new ideas as possible, no matter how crazy they are. And then groups, it turns out, are much better at evaluating ideas. And so the second stage can be taking this list of ideas you've generated and deciding which ideas are really the best ones. When are you going to use brainstorming in entrepreneurship? Is it going to be just at the phase where you're coming up with a new technology, or is it going to be at other times as well? Brainstorming creativity is going to be important throughout all stages of entrepreneurship. It's certainly important in coming up with the technical solutions, but there are a number of business challenges, including the sales process, marketing, distribution, funding, that are also going to require creative solutions. New unexpected things are going to come up along the way, and these are going to require creative solutions. So you're going to use brainstorming at all times. However, it's important to think about in which area of the startup do we want to be most novel. If every single piece of your startup is new, this also carries a higher risk. So you want to, as much as possible, think through for our competitive advantage, where do we have to be new, and in what other areas can we just use existing, well-known solutions? So now it's your, your turn to brainstorm. Form groups of four. You can either be together as a real group, or uh, you can separate your group of four as a nominal group. And in the next, pause the video and give yourself the next five to ten minutes to come up with your 15 best startup ideas. So go ahead, pause the video, and give it a try. Okay, you've now got your 15 best startup ideas. I want you in the same groups to come up with your 15 worst startup ideas. Feel free to be as outlandish as possible. You'll take these 15 worst startup ideas and we're going to do something in class uh, regarding them. And so for the Stanford students, I encourage you to skip over the next part of the video and you'll see in class what we'll be doing. For the online students, go ahead and watch the next part of the video. So what I want you to do with these 15 worst startup ideas is if you can, exchange them with another group or at least exchange your 15 worst ideas within the group so that rather than having one of your worst ideas, you have someone else's list of really bad ideas, really bad startup ideas. And so what you're going to do is now that you've got someone else's worst startup idea, you're going to think of how to create a five minute ad advertising this worst startup idea. And so it's your job to take this really bad idea and turn it into something wonderful. 
So go ahead, pause the video, and spend a few minutes coming up with your pitch to the other people in your group about why their worst startup idea is actually a really good one. Okay, so now we're back. So if you can, upload, upload videos of your pitch for the worst startup idea somewhere on the web and use the forum to share these videos with the other people taking the class. It'll be terrific to see what you came up with. Okay, so now I wanted to give a quick reminder about the OAP project. So this is the Opportunity Assessment Project. This is your presentation uh, midway through the quarter. Uh, this is going to be January 31st and February 2nd, where your group is going to present to the rest of the class, along with a panel of venture capitalists and angel investors, about what startup idea you've chosen, what's the great opportunity that you're going to pursue. And so I want you to talk to as many customers as you can. If you can, we want both um, surveys showing what proportion of people that you surveyed said that they would actually want to use your product or service, and also evidence that you've actually spoken to some of these potential customers. So we want you to get out of the building and really test whether you can find customers who will actually buy this new product or service that you've dreamed up. And so we want to see some analysis of these results. Is there a certain target market? Is there a certain demographic or type of consumer who seems to particularly appeal uh, to the product or service you've created? And so you'll be presenting these in class. And so I just want to give you a reminder that this is coming up and you need to start working on this. So what did we learn today? We learned that entrepreneurship is about seeing problems, seeing customer needs as new opportunities. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. We also learned how to optimize or hack the brainstorming process to become more creative. And that often customers or lead users are a fertile source of new ideas. So get out there and talk to potential customers and see what it is they need. Finally, I'd like to point out that startups need a combination of a creative visionary and someone who can really lead the execution and operation side of the business. And so if you can, it's best to form a team that has both of these aspects. Someone who's the creative visionary and someone who can really break it down into a step-by-step -step series of processes. I hope in the course of doing the worst startup idea process, you've seen that there really are no bad ideas and uh, that this will encourage you to be more creative in your venture ideas. So again, our takeaways, just to reinforce create, the importance of creative visionaries, lead users, talking to potential customers, and getting new startup ideas from your potential customers rather than telling them what they should want. There are certain ways of organizing and of running brainstorming sessions that can lead to improved creativity. And we've also thought a little bit about what the purpose of creativity within a startup is. So that's it for today. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.